All right, let's all stand this evening and turn to number 223 and sing the Springs of Living Water. Uh, number 223. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, O oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills of God, it makes me had and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I've trod, where shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh wonderful and bountiful supply. Sinner, let you come today to Calvary, a fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh wonderful and bountiful supply. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for just your watch care over us, Lord, your hand upon us. Lord, we, I don't know what we would do without you in our lives, and I thank you for the presence of uh, your presence, your hand in our lives, Lord, just bringing us here to this good hour, Lord, where we can look into your word and just study the book of Nehemiah. I pray that you would just bless, that you would be honored and glorified by everything that's done here tonight. Uh, Lord, that Jesus Christ and him alone would be lifted up. And, Father, we thank you for him. We thank you for the Lamb of God. We praise his holy name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, next we'll sing number 236, No, Not One. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses. Number 236. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one, no, not one. Will he refuse us a home in heaven? No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. 
No, not one. No, not one. Amen. This evening, uh, just be mindful of these upcoming events. Of course, we're having outreach Tuesday at 3 o'clock, not 11 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Um, and uh, just come out for that. Buckets and bows at 10 o'clock every Thursday. Uh, ladies' meeting February 20th at 11 a.m. Missions conference, of course, on February 17th is coming up very quickly. Uh, just be in prayer about that. And when I say that, I don't mean that lightly. Let us be in prayer about the missions conference. Please add it to your prayer list. Have special times of prayer. Uh, it's very important. It's very important to the life of this church. It's it. Missions is the heartbeat. I mean, missions is God's heartbeat. I mean, if you want to know what God's heart is, it's missions. And so this is his church, and so this ought to be our heartbeat too. Um, it's the lifeblood. Uh, do uh, pay attention to that. And then, of course, we're in the book of Nehemiah tonight. Uh, our memory verse is Luke 24, 47. So if you have that there in your bulletin or, of course, in your Bible, Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Luke 24, 47. Let's say that together. Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Luke 24, 47. Amen. All right. Heaven, let's have another song. All right, next we'll sing number 244. We'll sing the first, second, and the last verses of Amazing Grace. Number 244 in your hymnal. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed When we've been there ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amen. All right. Well, good evening again, everyone. All right, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah this evening. Uh, chapter 3, and we worked through chapters 1 and chapters 2. We looked a little bit at chapter chapter 2 and all the things that happened there, Nehemiah and, and his discussion, his fear before the king. And the king, because the Lord was in it, asked him, what do you need? How long will you be gone? What can I do for you? And, of course, God used uh, the king to open doors. We preached about that this morning even, that God can use all kinds of things to open doors. If we, have a, if we have a desire to do the work of God, God will make certain that the obstacles will fall aside. Um, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 3, and let's, um, it'll be a little bit of a long reading today to get down to the end, but we're going to uh, attempt to uh, read chapter 3. That way we can understand the full context and understand exactly what's going on. When Elisha, the high priest, rose up, verse 1, with his brethren, the priests, and they builded the sheep gate and sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mia, they sanctified it, unto the tower of Hananiel. Excuse me. Verse number 2. Next to him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zachor, the son of Emery. But the fish gate did the sons of Hasaniah, I 
probably set a task that I don't want to complete today, all these names, uh, but uh, we'll try. Who laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and next to them, unto them repaired Mer- Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz, and the next to them repaired Misholam, the son of Barakiah, the son of Meshi- Meshazabiel, and next to them repaired Zadok, the son of Bana. Next to them, the, Kateko- the Tekoites repaired, and there but their nobles put not their necks unto to the work of the Lord. Now, I want to stop and just say, now when you read these things, when you read genealogies, if you get the book of Leviticus, you get into all these different books and you think, oh man, these genealogies are all these long lists. I want you to notice, if you will carefully read through them, there's important facts that will come out. And if you will notice that here in verse number 5, that the, te- the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles, not their nobles, their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. God called out this specific difference. And I think if you, anytime you see these long lists of names, and stuff like that, God always throws some things of interest in there. Just, just trust me. If you'll read through them, you'll, you'll pick up something. Now, verse number 6. Moreover, the old gate repaired Je- Jehoiada, Jehoiada, the son of Pesia, and Meshulam, the son of Besodea. They laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. And next unto them prepared Melatea, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Maranothite, 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 the men of Gibeon, and on the Mizpah, and to the throne of the governor on this side of the river. Now, I'm going to read through a couple more of these. I'm going to try to skip the names just because they're hard to pronounce, particularly when you're reading them out loud. But I want to say verse number 8, Uziel, the son of Heriah, of the goldsmiths. See, the goldsmiths, they weren't building the wall out of gold, but the goldsmiths, these men who had a trade... They were still building. They repaired the wall. They were doing things that wasn't necessarily in their line. Next unto him, Hananiah, the son of one of the apothecaries. This guy is a pharmacist, if you will. But he's there building the wall. He didn't say, that's not my line of work. I'm not a stonemason. No, he picked up a trowel. He picked up a sword, and he's building the wall. Okay? Okay. Um, Next unto them repaired, oh, excuse me, they fortified Jerusalem under the broad wall. Next unto them, verse 9, repaired Rephaiah, the son of Hur, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. Next unto them repaired Jedidiah, the son of Haramumph. And then even over against his house, next to them prepared Hattush, the son of Hashabniah. And then on and on and on. Now, here's the thing. Each of these, if you read each verse, the valley gate repaired Hanan, verse 13, but the dung gate repaired Malchiah, but of the gate of the fountain repaired Shalom, the son of Kohalze. And, and it goes on, it repaired, verse number 16, after him repaired Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, uh, verse 17, after him repaired the Levites, the priests even got, the priests didn't say, you know, we're just, we're priests, we can't get our hands dirty. No, no, they put on some work clothes and they were out there working working to do this job. Um, Verse number 18. Matter of fact, even the rulers you see in verse 17. Verse number 18. After him repaired their brethren. Uh, Next to him repaired Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the ruler of Mizpah. Another piece uh, over against the going up the armory at the turning of the wall. So he's basically telling each piece that each, each man and each group and each family was repairing. After him, Barak, the son of, Zab- of Zabbi, earnestly repaired the other piece from the turning of the wall. It must have been hard work because he was earnestly repairing. It must have been a lot of problems there. I guess it probably wasn't quite square and plumb. Maybe the wall wasn't straight. We, we've never run into any th- problems like that in the, in the renovations back here, but he did. So he was earnestly repairing the wall. Verse number 21, After him repaired Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Koz, another piece from the door, and he tells the piece. After him repaired the priests, the men of the plain. After them, him repaired Benjamin, Hashab, over against their house. After him repaired Benue, Benui, the son of Henadad, another piece. On and on. Palal, the son of Uzai, over against the turning of the wall to the tower which lieth out from the king's high uh, house, which was that was by the court of the prison. Um, the Nethanims dwelt in Ophel, under the place uh, 
over against the Watergate. They worked on that. After them, the Tekoites, they come back again. I bet their nobles still aren't helping them. They repaired another piece over against the great uh, tower that lieth out. From above the horse gate repaired the priests, every one over against his house. After them repaired Zadok, the son of Emmer, over against his house. And you go on down through here, and every one of them, uh, verse 31, Malchah the goldsmith's son at the place of the Nethanims, he took up where there, was a, where there was a spot. He found a place to get in the middle. of. He said, hey, nobody's working on this section, and he jumped in there. You got to kind of read between the lines. You got to see what's going on here. These men, they each had a sudden, and, 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 and they were working. They were working together. Now, this is chapter three. It's a long list, and I skipped over some of it because just there, there's a lot there. Read through it. Read through it and look at all the different spots. And you got to think of a wall that is surrounding an entire city. How much effort, how much work, how much there was to do. This is a list of the people, the men, that jumped in there and did the work that God had put up on their hearts. This is the work that's being done in Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for the book of Nehemiah, Lord, the inspiration, the challenge that you've given us to do the work that you've called us to do, to stand up and to, to, to build and to battle and to do the work, to repair the walls. Lord, I pray that you would just bless us here tonight as we look into your word more deeply. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, the very first thing that I want to see is back in verse in chapter 3, you'll see something, um, you'll see something very interesting in verse number 20. Or excuse me, chapter 2, verse number 20. Then I answered them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us, therefore we his servants will arise and build. And oh, he's talking to the uh, he's talking to the bad guys there. But the point is that the people of Jerusalem they said, "Let us now." Uh, verse seventeen. That's what I'm looking for. Ye see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth wait, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall that we be no more a reproach. Verse eighteen. And they answered and said, "Let us rise up." And build. They saw that there was a need. They didn't have to have their nose rubbed in it. They saw that there was a need. They had a definite need, and they took ownership of that need. They said, let us, let it us, not let somebody else, not let those guys, not let the priests, not let the goldsmiths. They weren't pointing fingers at everyone else. They said, let us. They brought themselves into that. They took ownership of the problem. They said, let us rise up and build because they had seen the need for this work. The city was lying in ruins. The city was destroyed. Now, there was a need for this work. Uh, look at Joshua chapter 6. Well, uh, just instead of going through the whole chapter, Joshua chapter 6, Joshua chapter 6 is the story of, with, by faith, the walls of the city of Jericho fell. It was by faith. They marched around it, and the walls fell, just like God caused it to happen. It was by faith that the walls fell, and guess what? It was by faith that they rose up and built. You say, but there was a lot of more effort in the faith of building the wall versus the faith that tore down the walls of Jericho. Well, yeah, but it was still by faith. It was still by faith. They still had faith in God. They still had a call upon God. They were still following God's instructions. The, ruse, the walls of Jerusalem were not built not to be built by faith alone. It was also faith with works. All right, let's turn here to John, James chapter 2. I was just reading this this morning, as a matter of fact. Just happened to be in my Bible reading this morning, the book of James. James chapter 2. Verse number 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, in this case... We're not talking about lost people. We're not talking about getting saved. We're not talking about good works for salvation, by the way. Let me just point that out. That this, James chapter 2 is not talking about works for salvation. James chapter 2 is talking about the works that saved people ought to want to do. God changed our want-tos. You know, He created us. When we get saved, we are new creatures. 
And our old life, our old lifestyle, our old creature, the old man has passed away. Behold, the Bible says, all things have become new. He's changed our want to's. Now, in this case, in James chapter 2, just let me point something out to you. Uh, many times that there's, uh, like verse number 20, uh, people who believe in good works for salvation will pull out James chapter 2, verse 20, and they say, wilt thou, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Let me point you to the punctuation at the end of that sentence. That is not a period. That is a question mark. That means it's a question, just in case you were wondering. It's not a declarative sentence. He's, and, and realize that James is also speaking to a very biblically literate audience. And a lot of times we don't understand this because he goes on to say, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing then how faith wrought with his works, by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled that saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Let me point out to you that he was called the friend of God 20 or 30 years before he took Isaac up on that mountain. It wasn't because of the faith on the mountain with Isaac that he was called the friend of God. He was called the friend of God years earlier. So it wasn't the fact that he, that this passage is often, sometimes I think people teach it in a misleading way, but the reality is, is faith without works, is dead. it's dead faith. It, and, and the reality is, we are to be saved unto a lively faith. Our faith is a living faith. And when we are saved, our want-tos, our desires change. Now, work is still work. Effort is still effort. And I bet you that those men here in the book of Nehemiah, they probably got tired at the end of the day. Matter of fact, they were working so hard, they had to take time off to go bathe. We'll see later in the book of Nehemiah. It, it wasn't an easy job. Just because they had faith doesn't mean that the work wasn't work. I have faith that the Lord saves. I hope you do too. Jesus Christ saved my soul. And you know what? I have faith he can save others. But that doesn't let me off the hook that says I don't have to go tell people. I still have to go out and put in the effort to fulfill the gospel. You know, he can make the rocks cry out, but he didn't. He chose to use me. He chose to use you to spread the gospel. There was faith. Now, faith... It works is an evidence of faith. Church buildings are built because of faith. You know, uh, let me put it to you this way. We started this renovation back here with kind of a goal in mind. It wasn't just start tearing things up and hope something happened that was good. You know, we had a faith, we had a picture of what it might end up looking like. And we tried to go steer towards that. Now, not everything worked out. The carpet didn't happen exactly the way we were hoping. But you know what? It's happening. It doesn't always happen on my schedule. Brother Barker mentioned it this morning. I know so often you go out and you go door knocking, you invite people to church, and they say, oh, we'll see you Sunday, and they never do. In my personal experience, I haven't had that many people that I've knocked on the doors where I've talk to them about the Lord where they've actually come to church, and then some other family shows up somewhere. I think the Lord rewards faithfulness. But you know what? It was still work to go out and knock the doors. It was still effort. I had to still conquer some pride. I had to get over some, fel some selfishness. I had to get over some of my own inactivity and, and pr quite frankly, uh, a man-fearing spirit. I mean, there's challenges to going out and spreading the gospel. What will they think? They might shut the door in my face. They might not like me. They might not think I'm cool if I tell them I'm a Christian. Well, I, I hate to break it to you. I'm, I've come to the realization that not many people think I'm cool to begin with. <laughs> so there's probably little danger there. But it still takes effort. It still takes, it still takes getting up and doing it. So going out upon faith. We have the faith, and that faith enables the work, if you will. 
And we know that to be true because the Bible tells us that our righteousnesses, our filthy rags, Lord, you know, works before salvation are valueless. Why? Uh, the book of Romans, chap- or yeah, Romans chapter 8 tells us that, that, that uh, the, the man that's in the flesh, the fleshly man, cannot please God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. So works of the flesh don't please God, but works of faith absolutely do. So there was a need for the work. They saw the need for the work. They were called into that need for the work. And then there was work for all of them. Back in the book of Nehemiah, if you'll notice this, in Nehemiah chapter 3, the name of the book is Nehemiah, but I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but as you read down through the book in chapter 3, yeah, yeah, it sure, yeah, I think so. I don't see Nehemiah's name starting out in many of these sentences, do you? I see a lot of other people's names. Where, where's Nehemiah? He was there, he was working, he was managing the whole thing, but it wasn't all about Nehemiah. Elisha, verse chapter 3, verse 1. And if you just read down, look at all the names, all the people that showed up to work. And there was work for them to do. You could probably imagine that there was more work than they had people to do it with. And I think if we look around our country, we look around this city, we look around our state, there's probably more lost people than there are people in this church body right now. You look around, I don't see, you know, the population of Naples is however many hundred thousand. I don't think we have a hundred thousand people in here. I think there's probably plenty of work for each of us to do. We have, we, we got a work cut out before us. There was a need for the work and there was work for all of them. They, the Nehemiah couldn't do it all himself. He had to have willing fellow workers. Pastors can't do it all themselves. Pastors have to have willing fellow laborers. Each of these workers had different abilities. And you got to imagine that the goldsmiths, you know, if there was any metal working to do in the rebuilding of the wall, guess what? They probably called over the goldsmiths. Hey, hey, uh, uh, can you come over here and help me with this? I don't know much about metal work, but maybe you can help me. And the apothecaries, you know, they're mixing up the mortar or something like that. Guess what? The apothecaries may have had some input in that. I don't know. But my point is they each had different abilities. They each had their trades and their work to do, and God could use that in their work. You know, verse 8, the goldsmiths and apothecaries. Verse number 32. Verse number 32 talked about the merchants. And in between the going up of the corner, under the sweep gate, repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. Another group heard from here in chapter 3. Verse number 12. Look at verse number 12. And next to him repaired Sholem, the son of Helohesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. He got the girls out there working. There's plenty of work for us to do here in, in in, in the work that the Lord has put before the Naples Baptist Temple. There's work for each member of Naples Baptist Temple. There was work for all of them. There was a need for the work. There was a work for all of them to do. And this work was voluntary. It was purely voluntary. Back in chapter 2, verse 8, we see that. Chapter 2, verse 8. We see the scene, he gave a letter unto Asaph the kingdom, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make up beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house for the walls of the city, and the house that I shall enter into, and unto the, that the king had granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The king volunteered this. He gave him, donated lumber to God's city. The people had a heart that was right. So there was the hand of service, this hand that God put upon him of service was spread. And the other people stood up and said, let us rise up and build. Let us rise up and build. They were in the yoke together. Now look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28. We know this verse very well. Come unto me, all ye that labor. Well, that's what we're talking about right now. And are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You say, well, they're building a wall. They're using big, uh, big rock, you know, stone blocks. They're building things with heavy timbers. Yeah, there was some physical effort. But they were relying upon the faith of the God, faith that they had in God that the work could be completed. Jesus Christ says, take my yoke upon... Now, is, yeah, there's physical effort, but do you realize that when we get into the yoke with Jesus Christ, when he says, take my yoke, he's not saying, I'm putting my yoke upon you. I'm putting your yoke upon you. He says, take my yoke upon you. That means, have you, I don't know if you've ever seen oxen or somebody, uh, uh, animals like that yoked up plowing a field. There's an ox, more than one usually. And when you put the yoke, a yoke of oxen together, your neck's in the yoke and the Lord's neck's in the yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you. He is working with you. We are yoke fellows with Jesus. Take my yoke upon you. And that talks about discipleship after salvation. He says, take up thy yoke, take up the yoke, and work for him. Everyone does exactly, uh, and, and let me say this carefully, everyone does exactly what they want to do for the Lord. Let me say that again. Everyone does exactly what they want to do for the Lord. And that's usually not taken in a good way. We give, uh, let me put it this way. We spend exactly as much time reading the Bible as we want to. We spend exactly as much time in prayer as we want to. We spend exactly as much time out in this community telling people about Jesus as we want to. People do exactly what they want to do for the Lord. And how do you know that, preacher? Because God eliminates obstacles. If we want to spend more time in prayer, we can always spend more time in prayer. If we want to spend more time in the Bible, we can always spend more time in Bible, in the Bible. People do exactly what they want to do. Now, some of these refuse to work here in the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 3, verse 5. The nobles put not their necks into the work of their Lord. They claimed him as their Lord. I, I, want you, I invite you to look at the language there. The nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. They claimed him as the Lord. They claimed him as Christ. They can't claim him as their Lord, but they weren't willing to work for him. People will do exactly what they want to do for God. Some uh, will give to a collection. It's pretty, actually, I'll be honest with you, it's pretty easy to pull out the wallet. You say, oh, that's not easy for me. Well, it's still easier sometimes than uh, taking up a shovel and digging a ditch. Some will give to a collection. Some uh, will, some like to give suggestions. I won't give them the collection, but I'll give suggestions. Okay. And I think that's where we are with these nobles. They probably were willing to manage the work, but they weren't willing to do the work. But there's always work for those whose hearts are right. Voluntarily carry on in their place of work for the Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, verse number 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, forasmuch as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. <laughs> I want to point out a couple of things in this, just... I'll make a few comments. First of all, you notice that the Bible here is calling the work of the Lord work. 
And he goes on to clarify, lest we be mistaken and think that work is some kind of euphemism for something else, he goes on and says, labor. That means it takes a little effort. But the, but the thing that we can be confident of is that our work for the Lord, if done properly, if we are standing fast, holding fast, abounding in the work of the Lord, that it will not be in vain. You say, I don't see much results from it. You don't have to. God says it's not in vain. The results aren't for us, they're for Him. Therefore, we don't have to see the results. We just have to do the work. He says He calls it work. He calls it labor. And I know that when I do that for Him, it's not in vain. Karis and I first got married. We tried to uh, buy into this little business called Tidbits, which was a little paper thing that you put on the counters and like diners and stuff like that, and you're supposed to sell advertising. Complete failure. We lost all of our money. Wasn't much money. We didn't have any money, but we lost it all. Had a bunch of these really interesting acrylic little things that you could set on desks and nothing to put in them. But anyway, didn't work. You know what that labor was? Vain. I didn't have any promise that it wouldn't be in vain. It was a game. It was a business risk. We were trying. Didn't work out. And I still laugh about it because it's a silly... Well, anyway, the, but hey, we tried. We were newlyweds, and we were thinking this is a good idea. It was vain. Didn't work out. The one thing that you can be completely confident that you can find absolutely written in the Word of God is that your work, your labor for the Lord, will not be in vain. Amen. What a blessing to know that your efforts, efforts in the gospel will never be wasted. Oh, I didn't see anything. Nothing happened as far as I know. You don't know. One planted, Apollos planted, Paul, you know, Paul planted, Apollos watered. God gave the increase. Now listen, this work was voluntary. It was voluntary. And as we voluntarily carry on the work, we can be confident that it's not in vain. The work was volu There was a need for the work. There was work for all of them to do. The work was completely voluntary. And here's the key. The work was united. The work was united. Back in the book of uh, Nehemiah, you see, look, verse, verse number two sets the, uh, sets the tone and continues on. And the next unto him. And the next unto unto him. Verse 4, next after them. Verse 16, and after him. Verse 27, after them. This is unity. This is togetherness. This was these people working together. And when they worked together, there weren't any gaps. It doesn't ever say, and then they're skipped a space. It says, the next after them. The next after them. Him. So it was an unbroken chain as they went around the wall, as the whole wall was being constructed at the same time, the next after him and the next after him. They all had work to do, and they did it together in unity. And it's to be the same in our church body. You know, uh, I, I've heard quotes from astronauts. You know, we put a man on the moon, and, and you know what they said afterwards? This was a team effort. Everybody remembers Neil Armstrong's name. You don't necessarily remember the name of some of those guys sitting in the chairs that were watching the temperature on the launch gantry. Well, still the same. Yep, yep, still the same amount. No, you don't remember his name. You remember Neil Armstrong's name. But you know what the astronaut said? It was a team effort. It was work in unity. Great things were done, but it was only because people worked together. It wasn't because one person did it. It was because a group, a team did it. And, and our church is to be like that. We're to be part of that team. We're to pull together. I'm going to look at a couple of verses here in First and Second Corinthians. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 3. You know, the Corinthian church, they had some problems. Paul had to write this letter of, of correction. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 9. For we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry. 
ye, excuse me, ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We're laborers together with God. We're not doing this on our own. We're laborers together with Him. We are yoke fellows with Him. Now, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 1. We then as what? Workers together with Him. But Paul, you're an apostle. Aren't you important? Aren't you too good to do the work? No, no. He says we as workers. Paul made tents. He would go into a town. He would try to start a church. He didn't, he, he didn't want to be a burden on the people. He didn't want to be a burden on the other churches. He would go in and make tents, which was his trade, so that he could go in there and start a church into a, into a city and town. And you see that. He was a worker. He was a worker with his hands, but he was also a worker for God. He, he, he did hard work to enable the gospel to go forward. I'll put it that way. church team consists, of course, of God the Father. Jesus Christ is the head. Pastor is an under-shepherd. He's the main, he's the, he's, the she, he's the shepherd. Each member is a living stone in the building. Holy Spirit is our comforter of God. It's a team effort. We're laborers together with God. And we are in a united effort to carry out the commission, the great commission, given to us as a church. Uh, you know, and we could go, we could go to Acts chapter one, verse eight, and all of that. But we, my point is that we were given that great commission. This church is responsible to execute that great commission. Our church is responsible, and that starts with personal evangelism. That starts with evangelism around our state. That starts with evangelism, and and continues with evangelism around our nation. And it absolutely must continue unto the uttermost part of the earth. You say, I won't ever meet all the people in the uttermost part of the earth. That's why we send out missionaries. Let God take care of the details. We just do our jobs. We do the work. We are in a united effort to win the lost, to see them baptized scripturally, and to disciple them, teach them to all to the glory and honor of God. It was, there was a need for the work. There was the work for all of them. It work was voluntary. It was united. And then ultimately, the work was successful. The word repaired is used 34 times in this chapter. It means made anew and finished When we do the work of God in our personal evangelism, guess what happens? People are repaired. What does repaired mean? It means made anew. It means finished. Well, how are people finished? By the author and the finisher of our faith. When you were saved, weren't you made anew? Boy, I was. When we do the work of God, it takes effort. But the results are people are repaired. We're talking about a wall here. We're talking about people's lives here. People are repaired. The wall was built in the case of Nehemiah. And there is a work for us to do in our Jerusalem right now, but it must be done God's way, and it must be done now. There are people dying that need to hear the gospel. We need to tell them. We have a work to do, and there's a work for all of us to do. Now, in the book of Nehemiah, we, we see a very challenging time, and, and we've preached in the last couple of sermons about the state of our nation. And we've looked at the fact that there were walls broken down. There were gates that have been burned in our nation. That's true. I believe that's true. But let me point it out to you tonight. You see... The reason our nation is in such a state is because churches 
have not spread the gospel, I believe, the way God would have intended us to do. That, that Christians haven't held fast to this book in our nation. It, it became kind of passe. You know, as I mentioned astronauts earlier, and as men went to the moon, and as our vision got expanded, as in we built tiny computers that go into our pockets, we've kind of gotten our eyes off of the eternal things and started to look at the things here in this world. It's probably natural for that to have happened, but over the course of the last 50 years, 100 years, our nation has not held fast to the book, to the Bible. What's going to help that? A return, repair. This chapter is all about repair, and you see that, and this one repaired, and this one repaired, and then the next one repaired, and the next. You know what? If we as Christians, if we as church members go out and seek to repair these walls, these lives that are broken down, God can do amazing things. You say, well, the writing's on the wall. It may well be, or it could be that the story is not yet over. You say, oh, I don't know what to do. I mean, I can see the book of Revelation. I can see all these things happening. You know what? I think so too. But that doesn't absolve me of my duty to fulfill God's will in the here and in the now. If the rapture comes tomorrow, that doesn't mean... If the rapture is scheduled at 10 o'clock tomorrow in the morning, I still have a responsibility to tell somebody about the gospel at 8 o'clock and at 9 o'clock. I mean, that doesn't change anything. We're to be working. We're to occupy until he comes. These men were occupying, and you know what they did? They built a wall. What could we do if we occupy until he comes? Let's stand for just a quick time of invitation. Christians, we need to be ready to build. We need to be ready to battle. We need to earnestly contend for the faith. And every once in a while, like that one brother, he was earnestly building. He had some trouble here in the book of Nehemiah. Every once in a while we run across somebody. They're having some trouble. And maybe we have to really spend some time with them. But you know what? An eternal soul is worth the effort. An eternal soul is worth the work, the labor. Because we're not doing it alone. We're laboring together with Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day. We love you. Lord, help us to be laborers, to do the work that you've called us to do. Lord, that we would go and spread the gospel to see souls saved. Lord, we know that you do the saving. And Father, I just pray that we would be available to you, that we'd be ready, that we would be willing to stand up and work. And Lord, we know that there is work for all to do. You've given us the Great Commission. Lord, help us, Lord, as a church to follow through on it, to execute your orders the way you would have us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be in the yoke with you. And Lord, you said your yoke is easy, your burden is light. Thank you for that, Lord. But thank you that it's because of you that it can be easy and light. Father, help us to get into the yoke, become co-laborers with you, fellow laborers in the work. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Now tonight, as we begin to sing, let's think about the work that goes before us, the work that we must do. Now, that's not just outreach on Tuesday. Praise God for outreach. You know, we had a, we had, a, we had a young lady show up today because of outreach. You know, she wouldn't have been here this week if we hadn't invited her. So there is that. But there's also work in prayer. There's also work in our own lives. There's work in our family. There's work, in, there's work for all to do. Let's work for the Lord. We're going to sing number 261. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, 261. That's the story of many people out there tonight.
All God's people said, amen. Oh, there's a work for us to do. Let's battle and build and see what the Lord will do. Lord's good. He's powerful. He can do far beyond, far exceeding anything we could ever imagine. Let's just let's put him to the test. Let's just see what he might do. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Brother Flynn, will you close us in prayer this morning or this evening, please? Amen. We're dismissed. Starting to sense a theme.